cancer, Alzheimer's, heart disease, diabetes, depression. You have probably heard of at least one of these conditions. And while they may seem unrelated, these diseases all have something in common. They arise from the complex interaction between our DNA and our environment. Over the next 15 minutes, I will take you through the captivating world of computational genomics and my research at the University of Idaho. This journey traces its roots back to my days here as a student at the University of Montana Western, where the inspiring educators in the math and biology departments helped to fuel my curiosity and propel me into a career in academia and research. My research focuses on untangling the complex interactions between variations in our DNA and diseases like cancer so that we can develop treatments and hopefully even cures for the most challenging diseases that we face. To tackle this problem, I get to use cutting edge computational tools and technology like deep learning, a type of artificial intelligence which mimics the neurons in our brains so that we can learn from data and make predictions. Using these tools, I try to unravel the mysteries of our genes, how they influence physical and molecular characteristics of genetic disease. So join me in this exploration as you learn some of the ways that researchers like myself are working to unlock the secrets that are hidden within our DNA. DNA is the three billion letter sequence of A's, T's, G's, and C's that we all carry inside of ourselves. For most people, if you were to look at the letters that make up their DNA, you would see that they have the same letter at most positions. However, some people have a different letter at certain positions. This difference in letter at specific positions is called a single nucleotide polymorphism, or SNP for short. SNPs are one of the simplest types of variations in our DNA. So far, scientists have discovered millions of SNPs in the human genome. In fact, SNPs are so common, they occur about once in every 1,000 letters in your DNA. Many SNPs seem to have no particular effect on the genetic features that we carry, while others have been instrumental in explaining why different people have different qualities. Some SNPs have even been linked to diseases like cancer and Alzheimer's but scientists are still trying to understand their role in causing disease. We can think of DNA as a gigantic cookbook, which contains more than 50,000 recipes that we call genes. Each time the cells in your body want to make a protein, they have to make a copy called RNA of the recipe for that protein. This process of copying down recipes for different genes is referred to as gene expression. To add to this complexity, these 50,000 recipes in your genome represent only 1% of the letters in your DNA. But interestingly, the majority of disease-associated SNPs reside in the remaining 99% of your DNA, which does not encode for protein. So how are these SNPs related to disease? What role do they play? Well, that's exactly what scientists like myself are trying to figure out. We've learned so far that some SNPs in our DNA are able to act like a remote control's volume button, dialing up or dialing down the expression of various genes in the genome. But this process can be a bit like falling dominoes, where one SNP affects some gene, which in turn affects some other gene, and so on. The process of trying to map out which SNPs and genes go together is called causal network inference. To help illustrate this idea, imagine we have a set of genes and a set of SNPs that have been linked to those genes. We want to figure out how these SNPs are influencing the genes and how the genes might be influencing each other. This problem is similar to trying to map out a social network in a city. In this analogy, we can think of the genome as the city and the people living in the city as the genes and variants. Just like a social network shows how people are interacting, how they form relationships, and how they influence each other's behavior, 
a causal network of genes shows how genes in the genome are regulating one another. However, unlike people, we can't interview genes or check their social media to find out who their connections are. Instead, we have to use data and statistics to estimate which genes share interactions. Like detectives, we lay out all the genes and we try to draw arrows to show how they're connected. This forms a network. The arrows in this network indicate statistically supported relationships and they reveal the direction of genomic effects, showing who regulates who in terms of gene expression. The goal in constructing these networks is to understand how gene expression is being regulated in the genome. But more importantly, it helps us to track down genes and variants that are responsible for causing disease. Once we're able to identify the culprits, we can develop therapies and target those genes or pathways to treat that disease. But here's the catch. Learning a gene network with directed arrows is an incredibly challenging problem in biology. And unfortunately, it scales in difficulty with how many genes we include in that network. As we add more and more genes to a network, the number of ways that we could connect all those genes grows rapidly. As a result, when we are trying to find the best network for our data, the number of candidate networks that we have to search through can be too large. More importantly, as a network gets bigger, it gets really difficult to trace any individual relationship, or for that matter, to visualize the entire process. We often end up with a tangled web of connections referred to as a hairball. The tools that are currently available to us to help resolve gene networks, well, they work well, but only for a small number of genes and variants. But you can imagine that with thousands of SNPs linked to every disease and tens of thousands of genes in the genome, if we limit ourselves to small networks of say a few hundred genes or variants, we significantly restrict our ability to understand what's happening globally in the genome. But what if we didn't have to deal with all the genes individually? What if instead we could work with units or functional regulatory groups or communities of genes? Luckily, genome interactions are like social interactions, so they have inherent hierarchical structure. In the same way that people who work at the same business share the same manager, genes at a local level often have the same regulatory boss called a transcription factor. By exploiting the hierarchy among genes, we can greatly simplify the genome's organization and make learning gene networks a much more manageable problem. This is the current approach that my advisor, Dr. Audrey Fu, and myself are working to develop to improve how we study causal gene networks. We're doing this by exploiting a type of deep learning called graph neural networks, or GNNs. These models have been really successful in recent years at solving a number of network-related problems, such as, or in domains including novel drug discovery, transportation problems, and social networks. So what makes a graph neural network so great for learning how to group genes? GNNs are specialized to deal with graph structured data. In statistics and computer science lingo, a graph is just a network like the ones we've already discussed for genes. However, a graph represents a very complicated data structure one that other deep learning methods aren't equipped to handle. A graph consists of nodes, edges between nodes, and attributes. In a network of genes, we can think of attributes as a list of numbers that represent gene expression that we've measured in different individuals. A graph neural network uses graphs to extract complex relationships between nodes. Specifically, a GNN learns a special representation of the data that we call an embedding. This embedding captures important relationships and can be used to perform different prediction tasks, such as 
classifying nodes into known existing groups, identifying useful or new edges in the graph, or clustering nodes into new unknown groups. Starting with an initial estimate of how a set of genes and variants might be connected, our method first uses GNN to learn an embedding which captures the similarities between genes. We're then able to use this embedding to group similar genes into communities based on their attributes and their connections in the network. From these communities, we're able to construct a new network where each node now represents a group of related genes. By repeating this process of grouping genes or gene communities, we can learn how genes are organized at different scales. To help illustrate this idea, imagine that we first take a group of employees and we group them by their store manager. We then take those store managers and we group them by the regional manager that they have in common, and so on. In essence, this process would establish how employees are related through the hierarchical levels of corporate management. When applied to a set of genes and their expression data, this produces a map which highlights genes that share similar regulatory factors or are activated by the similar regulatory module. Once we've figured out how genes are organized in this hierarchy, we can use causal network inference to understand how the communities relate to each other and how genetic variances relate to those communities. This approach is key in understanding gene regulation and narrowing down our search for genes and genetic variants that are involved in causing disease. But most importantly, it holds the potential to greatly speed up and simplify the process of finding genes that we can target for treatments. Just like the gene networks that this research aims to unveil, this research really represents a single node in the global tapestry of human creativity and innovation. With rapid advancements in technology and the dawn of artificial intelligence, a new era of human understanding is upon us. Closer than ever before are the promises of enhanced treatments for genetic disease and a deeper understanding of the human genome. Thank you.